Do you have solo economic dependency? That is, if you aren't working, you aren't making money. The Art of Passive Income Podcast is the solution. Discover passive income models so you can enjoy life on your own terms. Let freedom ring. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky. And for this week's roundtable discussion, the best of, I'm always really just so impressed by the collective intelligence of our community. But, you know, it's one of those things that no matter how bright you are, how accomplished you are, there's always a little bit of that fear about risk aversion and, you know, how much money do I need to get started? And there's like that, that you know, that little lizard brain fear that, man, I, I don't want to lose my money. And if I'm going to lose all my money, how much money do you think I need to start with? Well, first of all, I've done this over 5,500 times and it's kind of crazy to say I've never lost money on a deal because when you're buying an asset, 25, 30 cents on the dollar, there's someone else on the other side of that deal. Plus, there is a lust for raw land in this country. And just because I may not want to you know, buy that raw land, there is a pig for every barn. I've never been stuck with a piece of property. But re-listen to this episode because it really reiterates how much money you need to get started in land land investing. And this has been one of the best uh, roundtable discussions we've had. And it's one of those things that continually comes up. So even if you've heard it once, listen to it again, listen to it a third time, and you'll probably pick up a little nugget here and there. Anyways, if you're speaking of nuggets, look, go to landgeek.com forward slash bootcamp. Better register. The virtual bootcamp is coming. We can't wait to see you virtually. That training is intensive. It's two and a half days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll have breaks. We're going to have networking. It's going to be amazing, just like our live boot camps. Can't wait to see you there. Learn more at thelandgeek.com forward slash boot camp and enjoy this best of roundtable discussing how much you need to get started in land investing. And on this week's roundtable, we got the usual suspects. A full group. We've got Do Buddy, the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, how are you? I'm great, Mark. Thanks for having us. Good to see you. We've got your cohort in crime, the Zen master. Breathe in the mailing, breathe out the marketing. Mike Zeno. Mike, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Very happy to be here. We've got the most feared woman in the country, the terrorist hunter, Mimi Schmidt. Mimi, how are you? Great. How are you? I'm good. I need you to be Aunt Mimi and talk to my son about the CIA because after watching and binging Jack Ryan, he thinks he wants to be in the CIA. Hey, I'd love to talk to him just about um, those type of jobs in general, FBI, the CIA, National um, Terrorism Center. There's lots of different places to do that kind of work. National Counterterrorism Center, NTC, NCTC, right? Liberty Crossing. All right. Great. Great. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks. Good to see you. I love it when you call me Big Papa. Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are you doing? You're doing really well. I'm jealous I'm not on the beach with you. You should be jealous, but I'm jealous that um, I'm not on the second season of Lots. If you know what I'm talking about, just go to landgeek.com forward slash Lots and look over Tate's shoulder and see how he runs his land business and get some cycling tips as well. And last but not least, you know him, you love him, Scott Todd, scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist, Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I uh, I just realized that um, Mimi might be too supportive of. Yeah, the yeah. Family. So I was gonna I was gonna say you know after the way she said that, next thing you know, he he's not gonna be in the CIA. He's gonna be in one of these other things that she just said. These other acronyms and like you're gonna be like, what happened? Your wife's gonna be like, Mark, what did you do? You're like, I thought she was gonna talk him out of it, but she's talked him into it. He signed yeah. right here on a dotted line or something. I don't know. Move on up. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, you know, like, I, you know, I was doing some research on it. It's like, you, you need to know multiple languages. He's like, I, I know French. I'm like, not going to be a hotbed. 
in France. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to digress. Uh, don't say that. You, don't say that. Are you kidding? Oh, that's right. It is a hotbed. It Never is mind. a hotbed. Uh-oh. Okay, well, now he's definitely not going to talk to Aunt Mimi. But we have a really good topic today, which is I want to go around and ask everybody, how much money do you think you needed to start with to really get going in the land business? And then when do you think you need to start raising money? So let's just start with the person that's going to keep us the calmest, Mike Zeno. Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, this is a subject that um, it comes up a lot. And I talk, you know, Scott and I talked to a lot of people, Scott Boss and I come in the business and, you know, it's, I, I came into business negative 40,000, right? Well, I still had to spend some money, right? But the reality is I didn't have a lot of free capital. And um, so, you know, I always say, geez, you know, you'd like to have a couple of dollars for a few deals. So you buy 25 cents on a dollar, you're going to buy a couple of $2,000 properties. You want to have uh, you know, what $1,000, right? You know, you just, whatever, you know, uh, uh, you know, just to buy some inventory and then support your mailings. I don't think it takes that much though. I think that people uh, often miss, you know what they often miss? And I talk about it on calls them is, 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 you know, we don't, I don't know if we always talk about it that much, but uh, the micro niche they're in, why, why, you know, we're able to do what we do and the price points, our average purchase price is $1,500, $2,000. We get all our money back in a year. So I think sometimes that get missed, right? That this is a small little environment they're in. So we don't really need a ton of capital, you know, and that, and so it's really interesting in that regard. So to start out, Mark, you know, yeah, you got to have some money for your mailings. I don't care. You know, everybody, I've heard people talk about, oh, there's this mailing service, that mail. I don't care if it's a dollar mailing, really, because one deal is going to crush it anyway. So let's call it $100 a week for mailing. And then if you want to pick up a property, maybe $1,000 or two, 1000 you'd be good to go. That being said, I didn't have really any money. I just kind of had to like, just kind of like day trade, buy and wholesale, buy and wholesale. So there are other ways. If you're listening to us and you're like, I don't even have two pennies around together. That's okay. I didn't either but I was still able to leverage the power of a deal. If you own the deal, you have the power, right? I mean, you can go to anybody in the group and be like, would you like to work with me? Would you like to buy it wholesale? Like we assign this to you. So um, first and foremost, you need to mail. And so if you don't have a ton of money, don't, what we're all gonna say here, don't, don't sweat it. You can still make this roll. All right, I love it. So if I had to press you, Mike, yep. and just said for a number to start with, would your number be, Fourteen hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, negative forty-five thousand dollars. <laughs> yes, you know I'd say you'd be sitting pretty with two thousand dollars. You'd be able to get this rolling, I think, because you know that you can get a, you can get a couple little. Listen, start in the micro, blow it up in the macro, perfect it in that small environment. You can buy a property all day long. I I just bought forty-seven properties for a hundred dollars a piece. I'm buying forty-seven more for one hundred seventy-five dollars a piece. It can be done. It's not a. You don't need, it's, you just have to believe in it, right? So a couple thousand dollars, you're good to go, my opinion. All right. Scott Bossman, what's your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with almost everything Mike Zeno said, as always, of course. Oh. But, um, you know, uh, I remember having a conversation with Scott Todd when I started coaching uh, four years ago, a little over four years ago. During our first ever coaching call, we were afraid, I was afraid of running out of money. And... He said, and and I'll never forget this in so many words, you you really have to have more faith in the model than anything. You you just have to follow the recipe. You have to mail, as Mike Zeno said, and the deal flow comes. You as Mike said, you own that deal, and there are so many different ways you can move forward with that deal. You know, our first year in coaching, we did a we did a actually, I think we did 30 deals and half of them were cash deals. Now you can't dictate, you know, what the market does or what the market wants. But um, you know, those cash deals went right back into our business. They fed our business to buy more property. And it gets to the point where uh, it, it becomes kind of a churning machine in that way. You get deals that fund other deals. Uh, you get deals that turn into great wholesale deals. You take five or 500 bucks, thousand bucks, redeploy it in your business, go from there and uh, keep, keep supplementing it with terms deals. Uh, you know, I, I didn't um, take advantage of a couple of things back then that I know a lot of people are taking advantage of now, and that is uh, selling notes and land arbitration deals. I mean, those are great ways to make your money move. And uh, I would agree with Mike. I think a couple thousand dollars 
uh, you, it's a great start in this business. Okay. Okay. Um, not to get too woo woo and too much like law of attraction, but I, I really loved what you said about, you know, Scott saying you got to have faith in the model. Cause I used to get on the phone with Scott and we would kind of tell these stories about times in our, in our business where we really needed cash. And as soon as we were like, we need cash, the cash just came. Scott Todd, do you remember that? It was the weirdest yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a, and it still to this day is the weirdest thing. Like, uh, I kid you not, like, um, I don't know, back in October, I felt like uh, my bank account was getting pretty low and like it was getting to the point where I was like a little panicked. My business bank account, I was like a, a little panicked. Uh, and I'm like, uh, we got, what's happening here? And you know what? We, I kid you not, we had a string of cash sales. And next thing I know, I'm like, I got too much cash. What, what did I do, right? Like I got too much cash. And now like to this day, this was months and months later, I've been on a cash string and I've been buying properties like crazy and I still have too much cash. Yeah, now, now I kind of like, you know, do my vision board, just notes. And I, and, I, and, I, and I show people like, you know, not wanting to pay off the note early. But there, there were times when like I needed cash and, you know, they paid the note off early. They wanted to pay cash and it was insane. Um, Mimi Schmidt, what are your thoughts on this? I agree with Mike that you don't need any. $2,000 sets you up really nice, but you really don't need much. You need enough to mail, right? So many of the tools you can use HubSpot's free, right? Gmail, the Gmail suite costs you what? Six bucks a month or something, right? Um, there are a lot of these tools that, the, that you can, even the phone number, right? You can get the, the Gmail telephone number. So there's so much of this stuff that you can do for absolute free. Um, and then you can pre-sell, double close, do things like that in addition to um, wholesaling, right, and land darbing. So I do that a lot. I'll pre-sell property and sell it, double close it. And then if I write a lob check to buy the property, it takes 10 days for the person I'm buying it from to get the lob check. But when I sell it, I'm getting that cash in within three to five days. So a lot of times I'm getting the money before the money's going out, right? Just by the way I'm buying, by the way I'm receiving the money and sending it out. So I think that's worth considering. Um, and I will say, I think people think when I get a lot of this when they start, "Ooh, I'm having these issues with money management, and I need help getting over that." As an entrepreneur, no matter where you are in scaling your business, the management of those the, of cash is going to continue to be an issue. You just have bigger money management problems, right? And and having too much cash is an issue. I remember once last year, I took in a bunch of money from a retirement fund and took a loan to myself. Well, I was paying the money back in the loan before I could spend it and make money on it, right? I should have piecemealed it out a little bit and managed it coming in when I had the land to buy. So yeah, I'm coming up on four years this spring. I still have money management issues. I always will because I have a business. So those are my thoughts. I, I love it. I love it. So if I had to press you for a number to start, what would be your number? Um, so my son started doing it this past summer. He started with 500 bucks. 500 bucks. Wow. And then given the evolution of your own business, Mimi, when do you think is a good time to start thinking about raising money or borrowing from yourself and tapping other lines or other sources of capital to grow? I feel like when you've got the mailing and marketing down and you've got enough good deals, you understand the model enough where you can go out and buy. Um, gosh, if you've got enough money right after flight school, if you're starting to get in good accepted offers and you feel confident about the prices that you're paying for the property, go for it. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, Eric Peterson, uh, the technician, I'd love to hear your technical take on the idea of capital to start. And then when you start to think about maybe doing a raise. So I think I started with about five grand when, when I got started. Um, certainly I don't think you need that much, 
But I think that um, you should have some money for education. Um, and that could take any form out there. But to, to be able to educate yourself is a big piece of the puzzle. Without that, you know, you could be wasting a ton of money um, sending out letters or blind offers or postcards or who knows. Um, so the education piece is important. Uh, and then just enough money to mail. Um, if you have, let's say, four to six weeks worth of um, money for mailings, I think that should get you in, in good enough shape that, that you can start to get some accepted offers and work them through the process. And if you have nothing more than that, well then, um, you know, any of these other ideas that have already been talked about where, you know, you're, you're double closing, you're, you know, doing that wholesale or you're pre-selling or any of the other options out there to, to get that capital in order to be able to close that deal. Um, so, you know, I don't think it takes a lot of money, um, but I do think that education piece is super important. Yeah, I mean, and the most expensive piece of education um, that we have for the DIYers just starting out is only 1997. So that's still within, you know, the $2,000 mark, which oftentimes if you get the digital, it's, it's much less than that. So you could get the education and start mailing with around $2,000. Mm -hmm. So still, still a good number. Um, hey, Litchfield, what do you think? And Tate, did you Google what money is? Yeah, no, because I, uh, you, yeah, yeah. So, you know, cause like, he's like the Venmo generation. He's like, what is this thing you call money? He's like, is it, is there an app for that? So I used all my allowance for my land business, Mark, all of it. All of it. Oh, in all seriousness, I think I started with right around $5,000 like Eric. Um, and, you know, let's be, let's be honest. Buying and selling land is a capital intensive business. If you don't build your business correctly, you'll run out of money very, very quickly. That's the reality. So when do you start either looking at other sources of income, doing a raise? Well, I think it comes down to building your business correctly. Right. That's 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 the important thing. If you build it correctly, if you know what you're doing, if you know where to buy land, if you know how to uh, self close it and you're not using title companies and you're hiring VAs that understand what your objectives are, it makes turning the money very, very easy and it makes flipping your property, so to speak, uh, almost predictable. Uh, I work with a guy all the time and I swear every single month he comes to me with a new property to buy and it's like, fantastic. He makes a little money. I make a lot of money. We're both happy. And he's able to cover basically all of his mailing, all of his VA teams and have a little extra money on the side off that deal. So it's pretty impressive that what you can do. Okay. So if I had to press you Tate for a number to start, what would be your number? Uh, somewhere between two and five grand, I think. Do you include education in that? No, I, I, I would say that education is, it's an entirely different, uh, part of the puzzle. In my opinion, you got to have an education. Otherwise, like I said, you're going to hear somebody on the internet or some Facebook forum tell you to mail and target properties in your home state and you're going to mail and you're going to send out 3000 offers and you're going to get two angry phone calls and that's it. And then you just wasted $3,000. So uh, I, I think knowing what you're doing will not only give you that confidence to keep buying land, but it'll teach you what to look for and what makes a good county. All right. All right. I love it. And Scott Todd, when you started, Okay, Mark, I started with $10,000 of capital to deploy. Okay, so I didn't include that didn't include mailings, education, whatever, I just had $10,000 of capital to deploy. Uh, and basically, I would tell you, I probably had too much money. Because the first property that I bought, like I had to own it. And I probably overpaid, I should have paid like 3000, I paid 4000 for it. 
I, uh, I overspent. No, oh, by the way, my, my $10,000 budget, I actually went over. Okay. Like I'll admit it. I went over slightly, but by a couple thousand dollars. If I were to do it all over again, I would do something very, very different. I would start with capital of like 500 bucks. And here's what I would do. Maybe a thousand. Here's what I would do is I'd, I'd pick up the phone. I'd call my buddy Tate and I would ask him about land arbing some properties. And then what he's going to do is he's going to tell me the properties that I can get for a hundred dollars today, literally a hundred dollars today. And then I'm going to take those properties. And I'm going to start marketing the heck out of those properties. I'm going to sell them, create some cash flow. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing this to build up my passive income, whether it's that, but you don't even have to like buy the property outright if you know the right people and think about this correctly. But you know, if you had more money, that's cool because guess what? I know for a fact you can buy properties in like one acre properties wholesale for like 500 bucks. Like they sell. I mean, there are, there are people that we know that literally have bought some of these $500 properties and they've built a massive passive income on picking up $80 checks a month, $70, $80 checks a month. It's just like, keep giving me the little checks, man. Keep bringing them to me. It's mailbox money. But as we all know, it starts to spend, right? Like it starts off small, you know, it pays the electric bill, pays the car bill, or maybe it pays the, the, maybe it pays the car insurance bill for a month. Then it pays the electric bill. Then it pays the car payment. Next thing you know, it pays the rent or the, or the mortgage or half the mortgage. Next thing you know, you, you're paying off all your bills, but you got to build it, let it build. And I think the problem is, is that what we see oftentimes is that people are in such a hurry to scale They'll say, oh, I'm not trying to get rich fast. Well, they do. That's, that's their mindset. They want to scale so fast that they go out and they borrow all this money. And the reality is, is that, I mean, I've seen it time and time again. People go out and they, they borrow a bunch of money to go deploy. They start making bad decisions because they have all this money they have to deploy. And the next thing you know, guess what? They're out of the business. They're gone because they could not they could not deploy that much money at one time. Uh, so, you know, be careful. You think about it. Think about, think about the long-term perspective and build it slowly. And it will be a lot better than trying to build it all in the next six months. Yeah. I really, I really love what you said. Um, and I love that sort of the different take of, I wish I had less money, which is the Jack Ma. If you know, Jack Ma, he started Alibaba as a, you know, Chinese billionaire and he, he really credits his success to having no capital because it forced him to be so innovative, so creative and, and, and just be so frugal in, in building his business the right way from the beginning. We all hear the stories of these VC companies that have too much capital and they, they, they came from day one, they just aren't smart enough to innovate the right way and they burn through their cash and then, you know, you never hear from them again. So I, I really love that sort of counterintuitive take of it. You know, my take is I started with three grand, um, Duran started with $800, but at that, that point in time, there wasn't a wicked smart Mike Zeno that I could just pick up the phone and buy a piece of property from for like 500 bucks and, and flip it for, you know, 2000 or something like that. Or, you know, I, there wasn't Tate. I couldn't really control a piece of land that might be worth five grand for a hundred bucks a month, which I could then immediately flip and start making the spread of a hundred bucks a month. So I could sell it for, you know, 200, 250 a month. And that baby money adding up, adding up. So as you guys are telling your stories, I can't tell you the jealous rage I'm feeling from the, the early days of, of going through this business and the unnecessary suffering that I had to go through compared to what everyone has at their disposal today. I truly am the land OG that had to walk uphill both ways compared to all of you. Just angry. Okay. Thinking about Good for it. You. And I can tell that Scott Todd has literally no compassion for that suffering. Because I, and, and, no, and nor should you because it's made me a better investor. I said, thank you. I said, thank you. Like that's compassion, isn't it? Like we, 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 we pay respect to the original OG. We got gotcha. you. 
Eight, can you help me out here? Yeah, and, no. I mean, yeah, you know, we gotta like like Scott said, you you know who the Godfather is, but uh, I don't really feel bad that you uh, stumbled for all those years. I mean, Something hey happened. man, Something's in the thank air. you for doing that. Thank you for wasting a lot of money so that I don't have to. But uh, you know, I'm gonna learn from your mistakes and save myself a million dollars. Yeah, and and I'm happy to do it for you. Tate. I appreciate it, man. For you. Eric, on I the other did. hand. So I'm not, I, look, I'm not talking about Eric. I'm, I'm happy for everybody on, on the round table and all the listeners. Very happy that I made those million dollar mistakes. So you wouldn't have to, it's, it is gratifying, but it is hard to sort of listen um, and kind of have to think back to all that, that struggle, but I'm out of it. I'm in a better place. And um, I feel wicked smart that, and wicked generous that I can, you know, go and help people um, with different ways of, of starting this business with very little capital and in those approaches. Mike Zeno, what's on your mind? You know, I love raising my hand on these calls. Um, I just want to hear Tate talk more about turning money. Something about that is just, I found awesome. Was I the only one that thought that? He's talking about turning money. I was just like, yes, turning money. I, that was a really great <laughs> description of his business. I just wanted to point that out. I thought it was amazing. I, some, anybody else feel that way when you said it? That was like, I've never heard anybody say it that way about a business, but I felt really gratifying to hear him say, turning money. That's what you're doing. If you think about it, every time you sell a property on, on terms, you basically create a little mini ATM machine. <laughs> and you go to it, and every single month, like Scott Todd does in uh, at boot camp, and you just sit there and you wait, and it's like, and spits out a hundred bucks for you. You're like, sweet, this is amazing, right? So every property I sell on terms, I'm like, yep, ATM machine number 400. What do you do for work, Tate? I turn money. What, yep. what, are you on the Ozarks? I turn no, money. I don't paint houses either. <laughs> Mark, it's funny. The other day, my wife and I were talking about uh, buying something for the plane, right? Like I was talking to her about adding something and I was like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if I should, you know, I don't know what I should do here. And then while we were at dinner, I'm sitting there and um, I'm sitting there at dinner and I see this transaction come across and it was, it was a cash sale and we sold this land and the investment, by the way, was like $8,000. Okay. Like we were thinking about like, okay, let's spend 8,000. So I'm sitting there and sell a piece of land and I look and I'm like, Oh, look, we just sold a, a property on for cash for, uh, for like 11,000, like 10,995. I'm like, what did we go buy the property for? And I went, I looked and we paid $3,000 for the property. Okay. Like, and the way that I see this, you know, Tay talks about the ATM machine, but I see the fact that I can literally buy whatever I want for pennies on the dollar just by selling the land, right? Like I can go buy land and if I want to pay for it out of cash, I can produce cash by just waiting for a property to sell or a property or two to sell for turn or on, on cash, right? Like, cause it happens 25% of the time it's on cash. So I'll be like, okay, I'm going to buy something, but I'm going to buy it for $3,000. I'll wait for the, the something to sell. And then poof, you know, we, we all automatically have some cash come in the door and that's how I go buy things. The other way of thinking about it is like, if you want to go buy a car, for example, well, if you want to go buy a car and the car payment is $500, that might be two notes. Okay. Like two notes for the entire time you own the car. Well, you could set that up on a property that maybe cost you, I don't know, $3,000. Okay. Like you can make your car payment on properties, two properties that combined probably cost you three to $4,000. Imagine that you spend three to $4,000. You get some notes that go out there and, and produce income for you every single month that pays your car payment. It's like buying everything for, for, for pennies on the dollar, everything. It's just the mindset that goes along with it. Yeah. yeah I'll tell you the downside of all this though, is having children. Because now my kids, as they're getting older, are like, what do you do? How, how are we living like this? Because not only do we make money 
like an ATM machine, but it's automatic like an ATM machine. It doesn't look like work after a while because we have this thing 90% automated. So that is actually a problem to teach children like a work ethic. Like it doesn't just, like you had to do something in the beginning. Mark, there's another problem. And Scott talks about like, oh, look, I just sold this for cash. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I was uh, renovating my kitchen and we got a quote from the contractor and he came over and said, hey, your kitchen's going to cost X. And we looked at it. It's a lot of money. And I thought, yeah, well, it needs it. It's time. Okay, let's do it. And I said to him, when are you going to start? He's like, well, due to the timeline, it's probably going to be like, you know, two and two and a half months. And I was like, challenge accepted. And so I went into my office and I just hustled for like two and a half months. I flipped property. I sold stuff for cash. And when the contractor came to collect the down payment or the deposit, I said, payment in full, boom. And my wife looked at me like, what the, what have you been doing? I was like, I've been working. I've been working hard, working real hard. And she's like, you just made that money over the course of two months. I'm like, yeah, pretty much feeling all good. Kitchen paid for. And she's like, well, how often can you do this? And it's like, whoa, 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 there, honey. Like, I had to work pretty dang hard for this. Like, she's like, with the backyard, the bathroom. It's like, pump the brakes here. This is like a, this is a rare thing. Tate doesn't like to work that hard. I had to work on Fridays to make this money. Not something I'm trying to make a habit of. It's so funny. You got to be careful, Scott, because, you know, well, you know, yeah, you got to be careful of Etsy because that's where Etsy comes in, right? Like no, no man's dream website, Etsy. Like it's, yeah. it brings fear to every man out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's so um, before we go to, of all people this week, Scott Todd for the tip of the week, I just want to remind the listeners that today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. And if you want to build your own ATM machine, yes, you can invest in ATM machines, maybe make 20 to 30% on your money, which is fantastic. Or you can build your own ATM machine that every month will spit out cash at a 300 to a thousand percent return. And obviously you need to start with very little capital, $2,000, $3,000, 5,000. Scott Todd would recommend having less $500. $500. The only way you're going to learn more about 16 weeks of going up that land investing mountain quickly, safely, efficiently with Scott Todd as your Sherpa is if you get on a call, a free strategy call with dude buddy, the nightcap OG Scott Bossman and the Zen master, wicked smart, Mike Zeno. Just go to langeek.com forward slash training and schedule that call. Um, Scott Todd, tip of the week what do you got okay all right do you know what the biggest the biggest lie ever that we all tell do you know what it is anybody can you guess what it is that Mimi schmidt should always be doing the tip of the week every week no. on the round table no. <laughs> we all tell this one lie like i bet you on a daily basis okay maybe not daily but on a regular basis we all tell this one lie and here it is it's it's you go to a website And you're registering for the website and they give you this book called the terms of service, right? And there's a little check mark on the bottom that says, I have read the terms of service. And we know for a fact that, okay, maybe a small percentage have read it. Most everybody else, they're lying. They're like, yeah, I checked it. It's, it's not true. It's not true. So check out my tip of the week this week, which is a website called T O sdr.org it stands for terms of service did not read.org and what happens is you can either download a plugin or you can uh, peruse like common websites and they will give you basically a summary of what it is that you're agreeing to or what they can do for example like youtube it tells you like what what they can and can't do what you can and can't do and like how much of your data is protected. And then they give it a class rating a through, I think a through E. And um, so you can search for popular uh, websites. You can even download, download the, uh, the web browser, which will help you to understand whether or not, um, you know, basically what you're agreeing to. It's not like we're going to do anything to change it. We're going to have to agree to it if we want to use the website. So I don't know. Might be something that you might be interested in looking at. 
This is a really great Mimi-esque tip. Wow. It's really great and useful. And it's true. It's, I personally never read the terms of service for the most part, for the most part. If it's a real small company, I, I actually might. But bigger companies, I just don't. Scott, that's go. such a great tip. Maybe you ought to do a tip of the week more often. No, no, we'll, we'll leave that to you, Mimi. <laughs> but what we could do, though, is we, we could go to the guy that doesn't really do tips of the week more often. And that's, you, you guys know, it's, it's Mark, right? Like, he, even on the regular podcast, he, he's always giving the, the, the guest websites. And then he's like picking on other people about like their, their suggestions, like Jot Not Pro or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. You, I, I don't know. I think it's time that we rotate and Mark just has to like level up, level up. I know there's. Mark was kind of wah wah about my HubSpot sales blog. And then I noticed in the Facebook group, he was touting an article from it. Yeah, like see? Week before last. That's what he does. Well, I, I, I'm not to come to Mark's defense, but. <laughs> Careful. We can't, we can't hear you, Mike. We can't hear you. <laughs> but no. he does. No, put no, no, sorry, to, sorry. For instance, Rome Research Mark insanely awesome you put a, you put a, something in the in the group about that so he does throw tips into the group routinely i'd have to so i'm just saying yeah i, I don't yeah, know my, I, I, don't. I, I do want to just say that if you would like me to do more tips then let me know in your review of the podcast. All you have to do is subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review at support at thelandgeek.com. And you can even put in the, t in, the t in the review, love the podcast, wish Mark would be doing more of the tips of the week because obviously memes are great, but Scott Todd's are average and oh. we certainly don't want to go down the road of Eric's Jot Not Pro. So um, leave us that and, you know, email it at support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit course, as well as the new wholetailing course, how to double your money in three days or less. If you are not in the free Land Geek official motivation and wealth creation group, thank you, Mike, because I do throw out wonderful tips at least once a week. So take that, Scott Todd, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> you, you, you know, Mark, that, that Rome research has sent me down a rabbit hole. That was pretty cool, right? Yeah, because then I read some, I just, I just sent to all of you on Voxer a link to an article all about the whole idea of how our brains are shifting with the, from how we read things. It's, it's uh, and, and if anybody's not talking about, Mark, put in the group it's uh, Rome research it's kind of I don't know if we call it a mind mapping it's kind of like Evernote on steroids it's, yeah it's, it's it's mind mapping in a sort of a different way in the way that we think um it's and it's it's really cool so um are we ready to do this are we good one oh no, we're not good two <laughs> one two Three, let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring. By the way, speaking of the of the motion, motivation group, we did get people responding saying they love the bonus part of the podcast. So there you go. So let it's, not, it's not. Here we go. So, well, in the beginning of the podcast, I thought it was really interesting. Um, I had some really good kind of funny lines to Mike Zeno about his Microsoft Surface. And then Scott Todd chimed in with a great statistic. Yeah, just a, just a little uh, thought. I've been thinking about this greatly. And, you know, we, we get a lot of flack for being the Surface, okay? Like the Surface gang here, a lot of flack. But when you think about the numbers, let's think about some numbers here. Let's do a deep dive into the numbers, Mark, because the numbers don't lie. And I do believe in correlation. So here's what I noticed. Apple has a market share on the, the PC market share is about 33%. Okay, about a third of users are using uh, Mac products today or Apple products today. 
So clearly, Windows is the platform that's used by most people. Additionally, what I also found interesting from our conversation last week is that a third of the people, I think this was quoted by Tate, he said a third of the people like to push the recline button and recline. Is it a coincidence that they might be the same people, the Mac users or the recliners, and the Windows users are the compassionate, respectful people who love fellow man? Yeah, Just, Scott, I don't, I don't know about that, but it does tell me one thing. Eric reclines. I knew it. I knew he was a recliner. I knew he was embarrassed. I knew he was afraid to come to my aid because he was afraid of getting cyberbullied on the Facebook. Oh, that's, that's what it comes what it, down to. I think what it does show though is there has been some rumors that said that you, you had a surface. So clearly you don't. No, yeah. absolutely not. You know what, you know what oh. happens when someone reclines? I like overpaying for my computers. And they're on the plane, they recline, and they take away my traditional what be for a Mac computer space. I just take off the keyboard, I reach back, I, like, I reach around and say, excuse me, I have an extra pillow, would you like it? Um, and I, you know, it's just a very casual, no problem, really. Very compassionate. Yeah, you know, you know what's you funny is that, that this, is, this is literally like, I don't know if you guys watch on HBO, but it's, there's been 10 seasons of it. And literally this could be an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> Yes. It could be, yeah. Because you, you would know Larry David would be irate that someone would be in his in his oh, he would, he face would on an airplane. No, no, he, he would, would be recline. Tate's position. He would recline. He, he would, would recline. recline. I don't think he'd be a, He's not a recliner, I can tell you, because I've seen enough episodes, because he really is sort of this, the unwritten rule follower. For example, if you're a guest in someone's house, you tiptoe. You tiptoe. Right. You, you're, you're just, there's just this thing like you, you just, you know, you don't, you don't open the fridge. You ask permission. You don't just go into the pantry. Now there's obviously just like reclining. There's no sign that says you should tiptoe, but you do. Is it okay to open the medicine cabinet if you had a headache? No, no. no. You tiptoe in someone else's house. You don't open their cabinets. You don't, even, especially like, at the medicine well, cabinet. Ask if you can go to the bathroom. Like, where's the I mean, restroom? There, yeah, Eric, have you had any guests in the new house yet? Um, yeah, we've had some guests. And how were they? <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> public. <laughs> I think everybody was good so far. Did they behave to Mark's yeah. standards? Except my father-in-law doesn't like to take off his shoes in the house. Uh -oh. Can I okay, it? That's the same thing as reclining. If the rule is, oh. you know, we take our shoes off and they refuse to do it, I would send them to Vegas. Like, I got the perfect house to go to. I'm a pair you of You don't take our shoes off. I'm a pair of he, I take my shoes know. off and I step into house shoes. Yeah, so they have fine. their house shoes yeah, yeah, when they yeah. come to your house. Just find them. I mean, I'm not going to tell my guests. I think it's part of being a good host, too, though. Like, oh, you want to wear your shoes? Ooh, I mean, come on now. Do you think being a good host is letting somebody from the outside world stomp around in your so home? I'm not saying with it's their not. Dirty dirty feet? No. Come on, man. No, being a good what, host what is this? like, can I get you something to drink? Or can I get you something to eat? Not stomp around with your muddy shoes in my house. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Desert, Mark. <laughs> if that's, you do too. If there's that's never the been mud in your house. If that's the household rule that you need to take off your shoes, as a host, like maybe tell me in advance so I can make sure I'm wearing some socks and then I'm not walking around your house like barefooted. Like, I don't know. That seems a little creepy to me. Mike Zano, what do you think? <laughs> let's just go around. Let's, this is a round table topic. Shoes or no shoes in the Zano home? I think that you should not wear shoes in somebody else, else's house. And I think it shows that Scott Todd's lifestyle that he doesn't wear socks. He's so laid back. He's just... Wait, on the beach all no, the time? No, I do wear socks. I do wear socks. Most of the time, I, I do wear socks. But I did go to someone's house, and I didn't wear socks that day. And then, like, they're like, oh, please take off your shoes. And I'm like, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> Sorry, give me some wipes. Someone like me would bring their own booties. Okay. No problem. I've got landing or maybe, booties. Or maybe you as the host should offer booties. Right. Exactly. 
Exactly. Scott Bossman, what about you? Uh, it's winter in Wisconsin. There are no shoes in the house. And the boys try going through the house with shoes. It does not go over well. So we, uh, we all make it a habit of taking our shoes off at the door, and we have, a, we have a little shoe shelf that everybody puts their shoes on and stays nicely organized for my wife because it gives her anxiety if it's not organized. So there we go. That makes sense. Okay. And let's say that someone didn't want to follow that rule. So I, I, it depends on the person, I guess. <laughs> you know, I think it also let's say Scott Todd doesn't want to follow that rule. What if you're going to have a dinner party? Cold. Like, what if you're going to have a dinner party well, or that's something? Different. Gonna, that's different. You know, entertain people. Then it's different, yeah. right? Right. Um, it's different if you have 50 people in your house and you've yeah. got women wearing thigh-high boots and, you know, they, they, and heels and things like that that are hard to get on and off, right? So those one-time events, yeah, but every yeah. day. We, we used to live in Japan, so we never wore shoes inside. Even in the restaurants, you take your shoes off and then you walk onto the platform where you eat in Japan. I know. Yeah, we have a landing zone right through there where everyone comes in and puts their shoes before they go, and all the rest of their stuff before they go upstairs. And for guests that come frequently, like the grandparents, they have their own pair of indoor shoes or Crocs that they can quick take their shoes off and put on, have an indoor pair. Yeah, I mean, Tate is just the house of chaos, so we know where he stands. No, no, no. Um, I'm not Eric, saying you, you can wear your shoes in my house. I'm just saying. I, I thought you just said you could. You could. Well, if you if you are inclined, like the, the house standard is like you come in, we take our shoes off. But if my mom walks in and she's like, I'm not taking my shoes off, it's like, I'm sorry. I'm not going to tell the woman who birthed me that she has to take her shoes off. Yeah, that's understandable. I mean... I, we know I, you take your shoes off on the airplane too, Tate. That's part no. of the whole thing. <laughs> How about that picture I sent you, the guy barefoot in the airport? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're like very clean people. Like, yes, we're you very are. clean, but you are. I mean, some people, they just get away with it. I've, I've been known to pack slippers when I go to friends' houses, just to pull them out and put them on in a little bag. Yeah. And, and, and people love it. It's a very... It's courteous. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. courteous. I, I assume that Scott Todd's probably not getting many house guests simply based on, you know, being a surface owner and, you know, <laughs> maybe having like a little Microsoft Surface logo on the door. Like that would be, that's almost like, like no soliciting sign, if you will. Is it? I mean, I, I connect with like, I connect with the majority of the American population. I'm just saying. <laughs> who, who, right. Whom are in despair and lonely. <laughs> Listen, all I know, let me just say this. All I know is that when you guys and your, and your, um, all your visitors come to your houses and everything and you get the coronavirus and I'm all alone. <laughs> coronavirus is from weird animals. I'm just saying. Like bats. Just saying, when you're interacting with people at your houses, just remember the coronavirus. You don't know. You don't know. So yeah. just don't interact with anybody. Yeah. So you make That's, everybody step in a like a, a big bubble. pool of bleach well, before they come we're gonna your bleach houses, first. We're going to bleach them first. We're going to wipe them down. And then, uh, you know. And then they go into the Lysol room. Lysol they room. their breath and get sprayed. Contamination. Free zone, yeah. Contamination. Yeah. yeah. No, we're doing that. We, we don't do that. Okay. So am, am I the only one on the, on the podcast that listens to or watches Curb? Your I do. I do. I watch oh, I like it. it. You, no, I watch it. Yeah. You, yeah. I, um, I did like the season or the episode one of season 10 where he's like, people are wishing him happy new years. He's like, you, you can't do that. It's too, too late. Too late. No, it's not too late. Yeah. Yeah. That was weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard him interviewed and uh, he's like, cause he's playing a character. He's like, and then he actually in real life said something to hurt someone's feelings. He's like, it's not me. It's my character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Someone showed him, someone showed him a picture of their dog. He's like, eh, it's a dog. Ouch. Right. Uh... Which, yeah. So, all right. Well, Eric Peterson, um, thank you for being on the 
podcast and a fellow Mac user, Tate Litchfield. Thank you for being on the, the round table and a fellow Mac user, Scott Bossman. Thank you so much for being on the round table and a fellow Mac user. Everyone else have a great uh, Todd, Todd, day thank you for being on the podcast. With me. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Yeah. Mike, Mimi, you know, it's okay. It's I, all right. Yeah. I was gonna May you guys you. go. Three, yeah. There. Therein lies, therein lies proof right there, Mike. Mike, he just proved the point. PC users are more compassionate than Mac users. He just proved it. See, <laughs> we love each other. We're the we're the we're the machine of love. By the He's way, the one more. We have the majority. One more, Scott, and we have the majority. One more, but yeah. Anyway. But until well, Tate, then, you're still the minority. Tate still has Tate. Look, Tate's on the fence. I know. I know things. Yeah, the fence. She knows things. I've seen him use the surface. Things. True story. I've seen him use the surface. <laughs> and it hasn't gone well. <laughs> yeah, just out of, off the table and kick it. Just out of fear. Down. Yeah. I mean, literally, for me, just out of fear of a drone. Um, thank you, Mimi, for being on the Roundtable <laughs> podcast. I appreciate um, that. Mike and Scott, I hope you guys have a virus free day. Thanks so much. I've been in the street for over a year, man. A year and a half since I got the surface. Not like the Mac. That that you know about. Oh no, it's good. I'm I'm locked down. I can see uh, I can see Tate late at night before he goes to bed. He goes opens a special drawer, unwraps it, and looks at the surface. Oh my God! Look at this! Look at this! <laughs> Wraps it back up. See you later, guys. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go do some deals. See you guys. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.